Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'm going to be discussing the structure, principally, of nucleic acids. It's not a video that's going to go too in-depth about the structure of nucleic acids, or it's not going to talk too much about the function, though I will sort of drop that in on occasion. And so, one of the things about nucleic acids that I find interesting is that <clears throat> we talk about nucleic acids as if these particular macromolecules are, are found only in the nucleus. And sort of this is a, a bit of a historic reference to their location because now we know that nucleic acids, when I say nucleic acids, I mean uh, ribonucleic acid and deoxyribonucleic acid, RNA or DNA. We know that these are also found in mitochondria and they're also found in chloroplasts, which are principally in plants. And so, or any organism that contains a chloroplast. What's fascinating is that most organisms on the, on the earth, like principally prokaryotes, don't even possess a nucleus, yet they contain DNA and RNA. So I just wanted to reference that. So there's these two basic kinds of nucleic acids, RNA and DNA. We're going to look at the, the structure of them. And so when I, up here, it sort of references the, the function is that they store and transmit heredity information, and this is true, but they also do a couple of other things too, which are kind of interesting that I won't get into, but I'll just sort of uh, drop, uh, is that some of these nucleic acids like RNA have most recently been described as being capable of regulating the transmission of heredity information, meaning that they are able to determine what genes along the molecule are going to be uh, transcribed and which ones are not going to be transcribed. So that's kind of cool too. So they store, they transmit, and they regulate heredity information. It's pretty neat. So you may know just fundamentally that organisms inherit their DNA uh, from their parents. And so this is a classic picture you might recognize it of a of a onion root cell in particular undergoing part of the cell cycle known as mitosis and in particular anaphase which is sort of I, li I like to think of as, as the tidal track meaning the actual separation of sister chromatids being pulled apart by spindle apparatus proteins pulling it apart and so the point is DNA has replicated prior to this and then each new cell will have one of the copies of DNA. And so it's partitioning the DNA because the cell ultimately when it divides, it's going to need a copy on this side and a copy on this side. And so mitosis is a cool process, which assures the movement of DNA that gets passed on from one generation to the next. But again, let's not be remiss to think that eukaryotic cells are the only thing like bacteria do this all the time. They replicate their DNA, which is shown here in this tangled purple string. They replicate it into where there's two copies. And then simply the cell elongates. The DNA is uh, stretched on both sides. It attaches to the plasma membrane. And then the cell divides approximately every 30 minutes. This is called binary fission, where one cell replicates into two. These are clones of one another. And as far as the DNA copying with a high degree of fide fidelity, these would be identical, but you may know somewhere in your past that sometimes there's copy or replication errors which result in uh, novel phenotypes, which is kind of cool. So in general, what we're talking about is that DNA is often in a eukaryotic cell restricted to the nucleus. This is where it mainly resides, DNA. And it's a double-stranded polymer, and we'll get into that, which is what the heart of this discussion is all about. And then in the nucleus, RNA is produced. So RNA is transcribed from DNA in the nucleus in a eukaryotic cell. As we'll learn later in a separate videos, uh, there's different kinds of RNA, but I'll just sort of refer to messenger RNA. So DNA, uh, a, a gene that will code for a polypeptide is produced. So this transcript or messenger RNA is then capable of leaving the nucleus via a pore. It travels to these organelles called ribosomes in which uh, another type of RNA brings amino acids not shown to the ribosome and translated the messenger RNA sequence into a polypeptide primary structure. And then ultimately this will fold 
into a three-dimensional uh, structure, maybe even a, a quadrinary structure. So RNA acts as an intermediate, uh, basically, but there's a lot to this. So this is kind of the central dogma, if you will, which is a, uh, a phrase that was said to be coined by Francis Crick, one of the scientists that are famous, along with Jim Watson, who determined the structure of DNA back in the early 1950s, 1953 in particular. So this particular video is more about the structure, a simple look at the structure of DNA and RNA. And so what I want to say about that is that nucleic acids are polymers. So polymers mean that they're made up of many repeating mers. So the mer happens to be a nucleotide. And when I say the, the monomer is a nucleotide, let, let me show you what one nucleotide looks like. The basic structure of a nucleotide is constructed with a sugar. And so this pentagon looking structure right here at one, two, three, four, five carbons, this pentose happens to be called deoxyribose, this particular sugar. Now, if I were to notice on carbon two, there's a hydrogen coming off. Do you notice this hydroxyl is circled? If there were, if there, and let me let me add it just to, for clarity. If there was a hydroxyl over here, this would be the sugar ribose. Let me write it out there. But since it doesn't have that sugar, that hydroxyl group, it's considered to be deoxy. And so let me write that. So D meaning not oxy, not oxyribose. So deoxyribose. And what is deoxyribose connected to? It's connected to three phosphate functional groups. So you have one, two, three. And so this, this would be one, this would be the second one, this would be the third one. And so it's known as a triphosphate. So deoxyribonucleotide contains a triphosphate. It's often referred to as a DNTP. D stands for the deoxyribo, and the N is a variable group, and the N represents any of the four nitrogenous bases, and I'll show you a structure of them in a, in a moment, but they're adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And so the, the fact that DNA is made up of monomers, there's actually, as it turns out, four monomers that comprise the polymer. You can have DATP, you can have D. CTP, DGTP, and DTTP. These are the four uh, nucleotides that make up the polymer, and those could be arranged in any sequence. And so let's take a look at, the, at, at those nitrogenous bases. And I say nitrogenous bases. Here's the penta sugar. Here's the phosphate group over here. The other two are not shown. As it turns out, when the polymer forms, those last two phosphate groups are hydrolyzed, uh, producing a pyrophosphate, which actually provides the energy necessary to catalyze the synthesis or elongation of the nucleotide, polynucleotide chain, which will come up in a separate video. So these nitrogenous bases you see here in, in yellow, they're classified, chemists have classified them in two basic kinds, either a pyrimidine or a purine. Now, pyrimidines are single ring carbons with nitrogen here, as you can see, and the purines are double ring carbons with nitrogen. So sometimes they're just referred to as a nitrogen base. Now, these are fairly famous, so you might recognize them. Cytosine is a pyrimidine, thymine is a pyrimidine, and these two are found in DNA only, and uracil is found in RNA. Notice the structure of uracil and thymine are almost identical. The only thing differing is this methyl group right over here is the only difference between thymine and uracil. And as a result, it, we'll talk about this, but uracil is capable of bonding, hydrogen bonding with adenine, and so is thymine, because they bond over on this side of the molecule. So these are the three pyrimidines, and the two purines are adenine and guanine, and those are double rings. Uh, I had a Davis, UC Davis professor that once told me that a good way to remember that purines are AG is that Aggies, which is the mascot of UC Davis, Ags, AG, there's always a house and a barn. And I thought that was kind of silly, but I still remember it to this day. I don't know if it's helpful. So, and they're also very pure because they're farmers. So as it turns out, take a look here at the sugar. There's another difference between 
DNA and RNA other than uracil is found only in RNA. The sugar in RNA is, I mentioned this before, is ribose. And you can see here it's the, it's the pentose sugar and it has the two hydroxyl groups coming off of carbon two and three. DNA, the hydroxyl groups only coming off the three prime carbon over here. Now that's significant when it comes to replication because DNA can only elongate in that three prime direction because you need that hydroxyl group to, uh, to link the next nucleotide. And so here's a basic structure of, the, of a DNTP. So right there, this is the, the sugar deoxyribose, if you recognize that. And this is, of course, a purine. It's a double ring. So the purines are double ring, the pyrimidines are single rings, and the purines are AG, and the pyrimidines are C, T, and U. We can sort of just use the first letter, uh, A, T, C, G, and U, and RNA. And so I was referencing Jim Watson, which is over here in this picture, and then this is Francis Crick. This is a fairly famous photograph of them in their lab at at Cambridge over in England when they constructed this model of the double helix of DNA. Now, double implies that there's two polymer strands that make up DNA. And as it turns out, RNA is often considered to be a single polymer, but there are some instances where it can be actually uh, double as well. So I'll keep that kind of loose, but, but, but I'll just go with the fact that DNA is, is often a double helix, meaning that there's two polymer strands, two polynucleotides. And so what I mean by polynucleotide is literally this. Each circle represents a nucleotide. And so this is one strand of DNA, and here's the other strand of DNA. Do you see that? So each of these are nucleotides. And if you go back to this pr previous, right here, you can see if I were to circle this would be one nucleotide connected to another nucleotide connected to another nucleotide, etc. So DNA is considered to be a polynucleotide. This is one strand, and so the other strand would be coming off to the side, which begs the question, if one nucleotide chain is connected to the other, how is it that that works? And so they're connected to one another via hydrogen bonds. You might know that somewhere from your past, but there's hydrogen bonds that hold the nitrogenous bases together inside the helix. And so, as it turns out, when DNA is replicated, the molecule opens up like this, like in a fork, like a fork in the road, and then new nucleotides are added like this in what's known as semi-conservative replication, which is going to be the topic of a separate video just on DNA replication because it's so significant so important and so interesting, but I won't get into it. I'll just say that DNA is capable of self-replicating by opening itself up like this. But I kind of like this photograph because you can see the fact that it is a double polynucleotide, ultimately, and coiled in a helix. The helix is held together by hydrogen bonds, not only between the nitrogenous bases, but there's some hydrogen bonds that occur along the sides holding the helix together. And then the truth be known, there's even some van der Waal forces that occur between the nitrogenous bases as they stack up in the, in the ladder because they're so tightly coiled. And so I want to, want to say about the bases is that they have complementary bases. Adenine always bonds with thymine and guanine always bonds with cytosine. You'll notice that it's a double ring with a single ring, a double ring with a single ring. There'll be a separate video discussing the experimental evidence that showed that the diameter of the molecule was such that it was consistent, which is suggestive of the fact that it has to be double with single, single with double across, because the diameter of the molecule is consistent. So that's kind of cool. And the bond that holds these nitrogen bases together are, are of course, hydrogen bonds. And, the, and the, those are fairly weak, but there's strength in numbers, sort of like Velcro. And so what's interesting is, you know, you want strength, but you also want the molecule to peel open in order to be transcribed into, or, or a book to be read, whatever analogy you like. So the two strands are complementary. And so, as I mentioned, guanine always bonds with cytosine. And here are, let me go here, highlight it. Here are the 
hydrogen bonds that are actually forming between cytosine and guanine. As it turns out, you know, I don't know if there's if there is such a thing as a detail when it comes to something as critical as DNA and RNA. So I, I can't say it's a detail, but there's three hydrogen bonds between guanine and cytosine, and there's two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine. And so that's kind of interesting when it comes to the amount of heat energy needed to agitate the molecule and open it up during replication. If we're going to try to replicate DNA in a test tube, if we're performing a PCR reaction, that's, that's of significance. So here is a picture of the base pairing rules, if you will, base pairing rules. And again, in a separate video, I'll talk about the research which suggested this, but I'll just stating it now the G bonds with C and A bonds with T, always. And so here you have it in DNA. Here you have one uh, strand, uh, phosphate sugar base, phosphate sugar base. Each phosphate sugar base is one of the nucleotides. And there are the hydrogen bonds that are connecting one strand with the other. And I want to point something out, else out that I won't go too far into detail, but notice how one strand of the molecules in one orientation. Do you see how the oxygens are in an up and then the oxygens are down? Check this out. If this is carbon one, two, three, four, five, you know, we often say these are prime, one, two, three, four, five. The one strand ends in the five prime, and then if you follow it bup, 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 all the way down, this one is one, two, three, the hydroxyls on the three prime down here. So this orientation of one strand is five prime all the way down to three prime. Check out the other strand, it's inverted. So it's sort of like somebody standing like this and another person standing like upside down and they're holding together this way. Do you notice here, as I come around the corner, this is the three prime up here and then bah, 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 all the way down, this is the five prime carbon there. So what we say about DNA is that it when you draw the strands next to each other, it all, they're, they're considered to be anti-parallel. Parallel, but yet anti, meaning one is upside down from the other. So it's five prime, three prime, and then three prime, five prime. The significance of that will come in with when we discuss the video of replication. A couple of other tidbits. I like this over here, this sort of three-dimensional. You can see that the way the helix rotates, there's this major groove that forms and a minor groove, groove that forms, and that's kind of cool. Also notice this, um, it's the total diameter of the molecule is two nanometers, half of it, the radius is one nanometer, and it's 3.1 nanometers for every 10 nucleotide turn, which is suggestive that it's 0.34 nanometers distance between the nitrogenous bases. So that's kind of a, a cool thing. So this is a brief look at, hopefully if it was brief in your mind, look at nucleic acids, both RNA and DNA and their basic structure. I hope you uh, learned something and enjoyed watching it. Thanks.